Well, here we are once again at the very lovely and sunny corner of Glenwood and Lunt. We're in the heart of Rogers Park. Uh, we're up here on the stage at the Heartland Cafe. You're listening to another edition of Live from the Heartland Radio. I'm Michael James. I'm your host for this morning's edition. And I have uh, three wonderful guests coming on. I have my friend Jeff Haas. Uh, he's a lawyer who uh, has just written a new book called The Assassination of Fred Hampton, How the FBI and the Chicago Police Murdered a Black Panther. A little bit later on, we're going to have Jill McGuire of the Wild Idea Buffalo Company uh, talking a little bit about uh, bringing back the buffalo and sharing some cooking tips for using this very lean meat. And uh, we're looking to, to have Dean Milano, the author of the new book, the Chicago Music Scene. He'll talk about the book and the commemorative musical events that are celebrating its release. So let's get going with Jeff Haas. Good morning to you, Jeff. Good morning, Michael. Nice to be here. Well, Jeff, it's great to see you again. It's, uh, you know, you used to be a, a regular fixture around town. We saw you, and then you disappeared out into uh, the wilds of New Mexico. And uh, lo and behold, you emerged once again with a wonderful book. Uh, well, an important book historically. And uh, it's pretty fitting for the times when uh, uh, we're trying to bring about a lot of change and reform, and we get a little picture of where we're coming from. Tell us a bit how you put this thing together. Well, I was one of the founders of the People's Law Office in Chicago, and one of our first cases, uh, three months after we opened the door in August 69, uh, Fred Hampton was killed in his bed uh, by a police raid. So for the next 13 years, my partners and I pursued Fred Hampton's killers. Uh, and so this book tells the story. It's a little bit about my life growing up in Atlanta, switches to Fred's life growing up in the western suburbs, and I tried to spend a lot of time learning about Fred from his family, from his cousins, from people who knew him growing up, trying to explain that he wasn't just the revolutionary leader with this charismatic voice, uh, but he was also a human being with a sense of justice. Um, and then I track the, the trial and the litigation uh, whereby we exposed not only were the police responsible for murdering him in his bed, but that the FBI and COINTELPRO were actually instigated the raid by getting the police to carry out their program. Well, why don't you fill us in a little bit on your own background? Uh, you know, I've known you for a long, long time, but there was a lot of things that I gleaned just from reading the book, and uh, it was great to hear some of your history. Just share, us, share with us how you got started and how you kind of evolved into a, a progressive uh, lawyer who took this case on. Well, um, I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, my family was a, a liberal family. Um, we both, uh, at least theoretically, opposed uh, segregation, although my family uh, also benefited from segregation. I was raised to some extent by this black man who worked on our farm outside of Atlanta and by this woman who was our maid, basically, but who became a very good, dear friend. But and I saw many of the inequities in Atlanta. The, we used to go, I talk about going and seeing the Atlanta Crackers play baseball. Uh, and this black man used to drive my friend Henry and I to the ballpark. But when we got there, he had to go out and sit on the hill in right field, and we got to sit in the stands. And that's what Atlanta was like in the 40s and the 50s when I grew up there. Um, I think uh, my father had worked with John Lewis on the voter education project. And my grandfather had actually defended Leo Frank, who was a Jewish man who was eventually lynched by a lynch mom in Atlanta that was working off of a lot of anti-Semitic propaganda put out by the Hearst newspapers. Uh, Jeff, in the book, you uh, juxtapose your own uh, coming of age with that of Fred Hampton's. Why don't you fill the, the, read, the listeners in a little bit on uh, who Fred Hampton was and where he was coming from? Okay. Fred Hampton's family uh, emigrated to the west side of Chicago uh, from Louisiana, from rural Louisiana, where, uh, and they, uh, his parents went to work for corn products. Uh, one of the, uh, a, a similar background, uh, uh, somebody who experienced a similar background was Mamie Till, Emmett Till's mother. And she also, she came from Mississippi, and uh, one of the first things that Iberia Hampton, Fred's mother, did was she actually babysat for Emmett Till when he was, re when he was young. 
and it's a similar history of black families moving from the South to, to the Chicago uh, to look for, particularly for factory jobs. Fred was kind of, uh, when he was 10 years old, he, he was living in Maywood, he'd go out and he'd round up the kids in the neighborhood and go bring them home to his house and cook breakfast for everybody. And he knew some of the kids in his neighborhood didn't get breakfast. So Fred started his own Breakfast for Children program when he was 10 years old. And this is just the kind of person that he was. Um, Fred also had a big head when he was young, and they called him Peanut Head. And so to compensate for that, Fred became very good at retort and was sort of the king of the nines uh, out in the western suburbs. And another thing Fred did, uh, he had a lisp. Uh, and so in order to overcome his lisp, he memorized the speeches of Malcolm X and Dr. King. So that he, be, and, listen, and he used to go to church and listen to the cadence of the preachers. So it was not an accident that Fred became a great orator, uh, even as by the age of 16, 17, and 18. Um, you know, it was, uh, those were some pretty uh, heavy times, uh, the, the late, middle of the late 60s, uh, and a lot was going on in Chicago. Uh, Jeffrey Haas, would, can you describe for the listeners a little bit what the climate was what the situation was. Uh, we had the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. We had the NAACP. We had the emergence of the Young Lords. We had the emergence of the uh, Young Patriots. We had the emergence of Rising Up Angry. It was, uh, it was an exciting time. We also had the Democratic Convention in 68. Uh, uh, Dr. King had been killed. Uh, tell us what, for you, what were the times like and what do you think this sort of crucible brought us? Well, I think uh, Chicago was sort of like a microcosm of the world. As you said, all the forces seemed to be at play here and even focused here. Um, Dr. King had marched on the west side of Chicago before he was killed in, in 1967, and Fred marched with him. Fred became the head of the NAA, suburban NAACP chapter. Uh, meanwhile, black power was gaining footage in the black community, and Fred embraced, embraced black power to the extent it meant black people taking control over their lives. But it was a very tumultuous time. Malcolm X had been assassinated. John Kennedy had been assassinated. Um, Dr. King was assassinated, and Bobby Kennedy was assassinated all in the 60s. There were riots in, the, in, in urban areas throughout the country. Uh, as you mentioned, the Democratic Convention, the anti-Vietnam War movement was at its peak. Uh, and of course, you had people in the streets of Chicago uh, demonstrating against Lyndon Johnson and the war. And the student movement uh, was on the rise. Rising Up Angry was a group that came into being during that period and joined with the Panthers, the Young Lords, another group started in Chicago. So you really felt all these forces were, were at play here. Um, and in particular, uh, one of the things going on in the fall of 1969, right before Hampton was killed, the people who were supposedly responsible uh, for the riots or for the demonstrations at the Democratic Convention were going on trial, the Conspiracy 7. And in addition to that, they added Bobby Seale as a defendant, even though he had not been an organizer, just because they wanted Bobby Seale off the streets. And Bobby Seale was in the courtroom, and he kept standing up saying, I want to wait, I, I want a continuance until my lawyer uh, in California is able to come. Uh, judge Hoffman, uh, uh, an old gritty judge, uh, refused to allow him to speak in court, and he actually bound and gagged Bobby Seale. They taped his mouth shut and taped him to his chairs. So while that was going inside the, on inside the courtroom, Fred Hampton was leaving, leading demonstrations outside the federal building, protesting what, Bobby, what was happening to Bobby Seale. And the image of Bobby Seale bound and gag a black man in court in the United States was sent out around the world. So everything was very much focused here in the fall of 1969. We also had the SDS splits. We had the, the weathermen in the days of rage. And we had these national actions in Chicago. So there was a, a great deal going on. Um, after the King riot, there were rioting in the city after Dr. King was killed. The uh, earlier Mayor Daley issued his famous shoot to kill order in terms of rioters and looters. So yes, it was a very heavy time in Chicago.